Hello, my name is Olivia Bowers. I'm an undergraduate art history student here at WKU, and today I will be talking about the U.S. Senate Clerk's Desk in the Kentucky Museum's collections. This is a capstone project uh, for the Mahern Honors College, um, and it includes an online exhibit as well that I will be showing to you later in the presentation. I dedicate this thesis to my parents, Clinton and Don Bowers, for teaching me that pursuing my dreams can help others in the process. I would also like to thank Dr. Guy Jordan, a teacher, mentor, and friend, for believing in me and encouraging me to aim for the seemingly impossible. I would also like to thank the staff at the Kentucky Museum, especially Sandra Stabell, Charles Hurst, Tiffany Isselhart, and Brent Bjorkman, for encouraging me to pursue this project and providing me with many valuable opportunities to learn through the lens of the museum. They have been crucial to the completion of this project since the very beginning. I would also like to thank Melinda Smith, curator of the Senate, for allowing me to visit the Capitol and dig through her collections, as well as bringing me into the room where this desk so proudly sat only a few decades ago. This project would be simply incomplete without their help. <clears throat> This Mahern Honors College capstone experience aims to highlight the importance of the historical object and accurately document the complete history of the former U.S. Senate clerk's desk, placed in the chamber in 1859 and removed in 1951. The desk's first and last occupants were Kentucky natives and civil servants, and it is curr its current resting place in, is in Western Kentucky University's Kentucky Museum. Through research that began in the nation's capital and a journey to follow the desk paper trail, the object's massive historical legacy and close ties to the state of Kentucky may live on. Along with a traditional research report of the desk, an online exhibit has been created in order to allow visitors of the Kentucky Museum to learn about the desk without viewing the object, considering the desk is not in a condition to be exhibited at the moment. By completing this project, historical gaps will be filled for future researchers and other interest, others interested in the architectural history of the Senate. <clears throat> the Kentucky Museum on Western Kentucky University's campus owns a desk that has played a vital role and singular role in the history of the United States. Although the desk plays a key role in our nation's history, it lacks proper, proper documentation and interpretation in order to exhibit it correctly. This paper is the first scholarly attempt to document and interpret this important piece of American material culture. The history of the United States Senate Clerk's Desk, completed in 1859 in time for the U.S. State, the US Capitol Extension, creates a unique window into the mid-19th century creative practices, as well as visual political culture. Upon finding out the desk is currently in storage at the Kentucky Museum on Western Kentucky University's campus, one may ask themselves, how a desk that resided in, at the front of the U.S. Senate for almost 100 years ended up there in the first place. Utilizing funds from a faculty undergraduate student engagement grant from WKU, as well as various documents, images, and transcripts covering the Capitol Extension of 1859, this essay aims to provide a clear and concise provenance of the desk and create a colorful illustration of the desk character, hopefully opening the door for further research and proper care of the desk in the future. Material culture documents history in ways that often text cannot. Aesthetic choices often reveal intrinsic, personal, and political motivations and can play a key role in interpreting the past. With this theory in mind, I believe it is necessary to create a holistic document to narrate the history of the previous United States Senate Clerk's Desk so that others may discover the desk's unique character and visitors to the Kentucky Museum can learn of the state's connection to their nation's capital. My project documents the desk and its path to Bowling Green, Kentucky for future researchers and historians so that they may be able to better use the desk as a teaching tool. The intention of this essay is to uncover truths through historical analysis and artistic investigation. The U.S. Senate Clerk's Desk journey began on March 1, 1843 with Daniel D. Bernard of New York in the House of Representatives. It was on this day that the House adopted Bernard's motion to expand the original Capitol building. Initially, the motion only mentioned extending the south end of the wing for the House. The following report, compiled by Colonel J.J. Abert, Corps of Topographical Engineers, completed in January 1844, stated that a similar extension should be considered as well for the Senate. The matter was then left for six years until, after multiple unapproved reports from the extension project, Jefferson Davis, then a member of the Senate Committee on Public Buildings, suggested an amendment to a civil and diplomatic appropriations bill for the extension that was adopted by the Senate and the House after a slight modification and price change. The bill was signed by President Millard Fillmore on September 30, 1850, and the plan was in motion. 
Several days earlier, on September 26, 1850, the Senate passed a resolution inviting architects to submit con concepts for the project. Thomas Estick Walter was one of the architects who responded to the invite. Walter was a native-born Philadelphian who became an architect through pr practical experience with his father, a master bricklayer, after years of back and forth between his formal schooling and practical experience in an architectural office as well as an architectural as an architectural and me mechanical draft student, Walter entered private practice in Philadelphia in 1830. During this time, he rose to fame, winning many design competitions across New England, including the Philadelphia County Prison and Girard College, a fine example of Greek revival in the United States. Upon Walter's arrival in Washington at the age of 46, he was appointed as the lead architect on the extension by then president of the United States, Miller Fillmore. This was not the original plan for the Senate, which was actually to divide the reward money for among the four best architects and allow Robert Mills, architect of public buildings, to combine the best aspects of each design to form an ideal aggregate structure, using the ideas of some of New England's best and brightest architects. Despite this plan, President Fillmore seemed to believe that there was no need for a middleman of sorts and approved Walter's plans on his own on June 10, 1851. The next day, Thomas S. Dick Walter was sworn in as architect of the Capitol Extension. Walter's grand plan for the extension focused on three major undertakings, the addition of a Senate wing and a House wing with connecting corridors and a new, larger, more grandiose dome. These, these plans were far more than just a display of the grandeur of the nation. They were also a practical display of the new nation's success. The Capitol Extension project was started because the nation itself was expanding at a rapid rate and as the United States gained more land, more senators and representatives began to appear in the nation's capital. According to State Secretary of State Daniel Webster, during his address at the cornerstone ceremony for the Capitol Extension on July 4, 1851, the expansion of the nation's size in that year compared to 1793, when construction on the original capital began, was unimaginable. There was an increase in states from 15 to 31, an increase in the number of representatives and senators in Congress from 135 to 295, a growth in population from 3,929,328 to 23,267,498, and a growth in Washington from zero to 40,075. There was simply no room left in the crowded dimly lit halls and chambers of the original, ch of the original building, designed by Dr. William Thornton, Stephen Hallett, and famed architect Charles Bullfinch. Something had to be done, and Walter was the man for the job. As stated earlier, construction began on the Capitol Extension Project on July 4, 1851, during the Cornerstone Ceremony. According to letter correspondences to President Fillmore from Walter, construction was moving swiftly, even though there had been several hiccups, such as the sandy soil not providing a steady base for the foundations of the North Wing. Everything was running smoothly until the request for an additional $1 million was brought up by Walter to Congress, in which the proposal was fiercely debated. On March 16, 1852, after much discussion, the Committee on Public Buildings was ordered by the Senate to conduct a thorough investigation of Walter's work and progression of the approved plans for the extension. Though they did not find Walter at fault for any wrongdoing, from this moment on he was kept under a close watch to ensure further spending was absolutely necessary. Supervision on the project was transferred from the Secretary of the Interior to the Secretary of War, Jefferson Davis, and several days after the transition to power, Davis selected a, su a superintendent and captain of engineers on March 23, 1853. At this point in time, another major figure in the desk history entered the picture, Captain Montgomery Cunningham Meeks. Captain Meeks, born in Augusta, Georgia in 1816, spent his youth in Philadelphia. After graduating from the U.S. Military Academy, Meeks took on, took on the role of Army Engineer. After his time in the Army, Meeks became a famed engineer in Washington, known for the Washington Aqueduct, a crucial part of early life in the nation's capital. He is also known for other stunning engineering marvels, such as the Union Arch Bridge near Cabin John, Maryland, which was, for 50 years, the largest masonry arch in existence. Davis chose Meeks not only because of his experience in the field of engineering, but also because Meeks considered Davis a mentor and political asset. Meeks was often met with fierce objections concerning almost all aspects of the project, from the choice of contractors to the appointment of Meeks himself, given he was a military man supervising a civilian project. But Davis remained one of his staunch supporters in Congress. 
Meigs' role as superintendent of Caps and of Engineers for the Capital Extension entailed many responsibilities besides maneuvering political roadblocks for the project, such as business management, contracts, heating, cooling, and acoustic engineering for the building additions, and management of funds. These responsibilities that Meigs assumed meant that, although Walter remained the highest paid individual on the project, he would become, in many ways, Meigs' subordinate, as well as many of the contractors, engineers, and builders that were hired for the project. As one can imagine, this supervision did not go smoothly. Only briefly did Meigs and Walter get along and work together in a reasonable fashion. Soon their partnership would become riddled with conflict about everything from the largest aspects of the project, like the construction of the, U the new dome, to the smallest, such as the wood, the wood chosen for the new Senate desks. Walter, who believed himself to be securely in charge, watched his unilateral power over the project be taken away from him bit by bit, and began to feel bogged down by the presence of his own foreman of sorts. The progression of the project would only become more contentious as time went on. Disagreements between Meigs and Walter became almost unbearable for Walter, who often found himself crushed under Meigs' upper hand as supervisor. Meigs made the project a ceaseless stream of disagreement and roadblocks for Walter, even claiming publicly at one point that the designs for the extension were mostly his and not Walter's. But the tide turned in 1857, when John B. Floyd took office as Secretary of War under newly elected President James Buchanan. Floyd was, a lo was loyal to the Democratic Party and used the capital extension as a way to use patronage to reward cronies and political supporters. Meigs, Meigs, a man hired for his integrity and honesty, was no longer in favor of Davis and found many of his plans and courses of action halted by Floyd as power was handed back to Walter. With this new shift in power, the desk that now rests at the Kentucky Museum began to take shape in the mind of Thomas Walter, not as a stroke of genius, but as a form of revenge against Meigs' previous lack of consideration for Walter's participation in the project. By the year 1858, the time had come to design the main furnishings for the new Senate chamber, and the conflict began between Meigs, the conflict between Meigs and Walter reached a fever pitch. Countless disputes were taking place both inside and outside of the Capitol building, and progress on the extension became bogged down by lack of communication between Meigs and Walter. John B. Floyd became the mediator in this figural war between stubborn architects and the steadfast supervisor, who would refuse to communicate with each other directly. On one occasion, Meeks drew up plans for the arms of the benches of the Senate gallery and sent them to Floyd for approval without consulting Walter. Floyd, noticing the designs did not correspond with the designs for the rest of the chamber, sent the drawings to Walter, who created his own drawings for the arms immediately and sent them over to Floyd's office, who approved them instead. On September 16, 1858, just days before the quarrel over the desks in the Senate began, Meeks penned a letter to President Buchanan imploring him to have Walter removed from his position and relieved of all of his duties, passing them completely to Meeks. Although many of Meeks' complaints concerning Walter may have been valid, they were not taken seriously by Floyd, Walter, or Buchanan. Walter, a friend and political ally of Floyd, was not to be touched by Meeks, and Buchanan was no help in the matter. The capital extension was the least of his worries with the civil war brewing deep in the heart of the nation. He only wished for the dispute to be settled swiftly so that this matter could finally be laid to rest. With this type of stagnation and communication between architect and supervisor, it was inevitable that the main desk in the chamber would face the same sort of, same sort of pointless bickering, with even more characters introduced as the capital size viewed widened in scope. Pringle Slight was hired as the for foreman of the carpenters for the capital extension project by newly appointed architect of the capital, Thomas U. Walter in 1851. Given that this position was such a massive undertaking, it was common sense to choose Slight for the job. In 1825, Slight was hired by the third architect of the Capitol, Charles Bullfinch, to assist with the completion of the first Capitol Dome. From that point on, Slight became a prominent figure in smaller Capitol buildings, smaller Capitol building projects as the master carpenter of the Capitol, often called in for minor jobs in all parts of the building. When the time came to choose a person for the position of foreman of the carpenters, Slight's previous ex experience and familiarity with the building made him an instant forerunner. Slight's expertise was used mostly for the replacement of the first dome with a larger, more impressive structure. His assistance with building the first dome came in handy as he was familiar with the weak points and structural issues with the dome had. He had also been the person who assumed the job of the first dome's upkeep since its completion and replaced its copper shell in 1834. 
The earliest discussion of the desk construction came in the form of a letter from Captain Meeks to Secretary Floyd in which the plans for his desk are included, as well as information concerning the materials needed and the ornamentation of, of the structures on September 22, 1858. Meeks mentions that it is crucial for him to finish the design before he left for the quarries and that he would like Floyd to examine the plans before they are fully carried out. Pringle's light was first introduced to the fiery dispute concerning the desk at this point, receiving the plans for the desk that same month. He sends a letter to Meigs during his work on the desk soon after. Slight states that a requisition has been made for materials being used for the desk, including a large amount of mahogany. This means that planning and construction for Meigs' desk had already begun when Walter began to interfere with Meigs' intentions in early October 1858. Slight caught in the middle of the spat only wanting to carry out his duties properly, had to put up with receiving letters from Meeks, Floyd, and Walter, all commanding him to do different things. In late September 1858, Floyd instructed Meeks to search for potential sources of stone for the outer columns of the Capitol. While he was absent from Washington, Walter came across drawings for the central desk in the Senate chamber created by someone on the engineer's staff. Furious by this and disgusted by the quality of the design, Walter went to Floyd to make his case against their fabrication. Floyd assented to Walter's request and halted work on the desk soon after. Floyd sent Meeks' drawings back, along with Walter's new drawings with orders to start fabrication on them instead. Of course, this angered Meeks, who believed himself to be the superior man on the project. However, he did heed the orders, but not without making his resentment clear. Meeks penned a letter to Floyd on October 25, 1858, concerning the dispute. The letter goes as follows. Sir, I have to acknowledge the receipt of the design for the Vice President's chair and desk, with desk of secretary, clerks, and reporters of the Senate submitted for your approval, rejected. Also of the design by Mr. Thomas U. Walter, adopted it instead. Regretting for many reasons, which I would see it useless to detail here, this action of, of the department, I have, in obedience to orders, commenced the construction of the work, and will endeavor, by beauty of material and workmanship, to make some amends for the poverty of the design. I beg leave most respectfully to call attention to my letter of the 16th, with which I have respectfully appealed through the War Department to the President to ask upon several agents made many months since in regards to repeated irregularities of Mr. Walter, which, while not checked by the President, under if impossible for me to ex execute successfully the trust committed to me. Of the receipt of this letter, I have as of yet received no acknowledgement. I have the honor to be, very respectfully, your obedient servant, M.C. Meeks, Captain of Engineers in charge of the Capitol Extension. This letter of correspondence makes it very clear that Meeks was quite bothered by the actions of Floyd and Walter, even going so far as to say that he will not accept responsibility for the deaths because he believes the design to be so poor. He does, however, assert that he will try to improve the quality of the design by ensuring the desk will be made with the best materials available in, su in superior craftsmanship under his orders. These incidents become increasingly frequent, with Floyd always choosing Walter's side. Eventually, in October 1859, Meeks was removed from the Capitol and Post Office Extension projects. He was to be reinstated in 1860, only for his focus to be drawn immediately to the threat of a civil war. Walter's plans for the desk included three sketches. One desk for the vice president, another for the clerks, and a banister-like one for the reporters, which was later scrapped in November 5, 1858, by Floyd. The clerk's desk is four feet and four inches wide at its widest point on the base, four feet and six inches tall, and 16 feet and two inches long at the base. According to letters sent on October 11 and 12, 1858, from Slight to Zephaniah W. Denham, Mike's chief, Meek's chief clerk for this capital extension, and Meek's himself, the desks are comprised of mahogany and walnut, ord ordered from Edwin W. Bender and Company, located on the south cor southeast corner of 8th Street and Girard Avenue in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Receipts and letters show that Pringle's son, Robert, made the journey to procure the materials needed for the desks. Progress on the desk was not hasty. In fact, slight remark to Meek's, Meeks on December 10th and 23rd 1858, that he was taking his time on the desk because it would be a shame to see them finished in a, quote, slovenly manner, just, to so, just so that they will be done in time for the original deadline. Calls were made in the Senate as early as December 16th to be allowed into the new Senate chamber, and by 
excuse me, and by December 22nd, 1858, it had been decided by the Committee on Public Buildings in the new Senate Chamber would be occupied by January 4th of the coming year. Slight remark to Meeks that as of December 10th, it would not be safe to expect the desks as well as the rest of the chamber finished before five weeks from then. Nevertheless, by December 23rd, 1858, Slight wrote to Meeks about lining the desk with cloth because the tops are nearly ready. The desks were indeed in use during the Senate's first meeting in the new chamber on January 4th, 1859, although several parts of them were completed in a temporary manner in order that they be used at the correct time. It was not until April that the desks were attended to once more to complete them fully. On April 14th, 1859, Slight penned a letter to Meigs informing him that he and his workers were in the process of, quote, making a more substantial job of them. This letter also mentioned several other components of the desk that were yet to be finished. Slight notes that Mr. Ashbury Dickens, North Carolina Democrat and Secretary of the Senate, and Major William Hickey, Chief Clerk of the Senate, request better locks on the, door, on the drawers of the desk, to which Slight suggests that the locks should be made in order to meet professional standards instead of being handmade. Also, he remarks that Dickens wishes for the desk to be covered with dark blue cloth, which does not fall under Slight's jurisdiction. This is the last correspondence about the desk between Slight and Meigs. It can be assumed that, given that the desk were so near being finished, that Meigs had much more troubling matters to deal with on the horizon Concerning his position on the capital extension project, the completion of the desk was the least of his worries at the time, and he entrusted Slight to finish the job responsibly and swiftly, like many of his other projects at the capital. The desk was finished later in 1859, although there is no specific date that is fully reliable. The desk's appearance is quite pertinent to the object's story. Upon first glance, one may notice note on its massive size, yet may not find anything remarkable to say about it otherwise. This is most certainly the intent of Walter's designs, which may also be a reason why the designs were chosen for the desk by Floyd during the mid-19th 19th century in America, furn America. Furniture making exploded due to the Industrial Re Revolution's mechanization of previously tedious workmanship. Because machines were able to build desks, tables, and chairs at rapid speeds, Average Americans could own fine furniture that used to not only to only exist in the homes of the wealthy. Revival styles of all kinds swept across the nation, such as the Egyptian revival with its Nile-inspired motifs, or the Rococo revival, which brought the furniture which brought the furniture of, the, of Versailles into the homes of everyday Americans. Furniture made in these styles were so heavily painted, gilded, and decorated with elaborate de detailing that was unheard of before the advent of machines. The desk completed by Slight in 1859 resembles none of these elegant decorative styles. Instead, it can be described as solid, colossal, and sober. Walter's designs for the Senate desk were most likely created in this fashion to reinforce the ideals of the Senate, a branch of government characterized by its elevated composure. It is often viewed as the more judicious branch of Congress, and the desk's subdued nature reflects the body of government within which it resides. Its size may also reference the weight of the decisions that the Senate takes part in. Considering it is at the literal front and center of the Senate, it only makes sense for it to accentuate the defining characteristics of the Senate, tempered, diligent, and paramount to the U.S. government. His, his subdued designs <coughs> were another point of contention for Meeks, who preferred more decorative styles of art and architecture. He, call, he even called them pieces of, quote, pulpit furniture upon seeing the designs. The desk that currently resides at the Kentucky Museum is covered in cloth, although the color is not dark blue and instead appears green. It can be assumed that the cloth has been replaced several times during its nearly 100-year tenor on the Senate floor. This lock, the locks seem to be made in order, identical in appearance, most likely not original to the desk itself. They feature an inscription stating that their patent is dated January 27, 1865 and April 2, 1858 several years after the desk was originally placed in the Senate chamber. The drawers of the desk are lined with pine and appear to be original to the desk, lacking any modern improvements such as drawer slides. Small wooden handles appear to be depictions of pairs of either European of con or Concord pairs with leaves that do not match the fruit tree. These are most likely original. 
The farthest drawer on the left features a pencil inscription on the underside of the drawer that spells John J. King, a man that has yet to be identified. The inside of the desk is lined with walnut paneling that may have been replaced if the need arose. The panels currently on the desk have undergone substantial wear due to shoes and chairs constantly hitting the desk. The inside of the desk has been retrofitted to hold wires for communication devices, most recently a telephone. The wires remain from this hanging on the left side the left side inner lining of the desk. It appears one of the center drawers has also been retrofitted to accept wires as a hole has been cut into the bottom of it right next to the lock, which is missing. The exterior of the desk is mahogany, curved at points to allow for the curvature of the overall structure. The front, interior, the front exterior of the desk is composed of three parts, two ends curved around 180 degrees to create a small cavernous space on the backside broken up by an ornamental panel with relief molding and frontal panels featuring the traditional patriotic shield with 13 stars and 13 stripes. The frontal panel is set forward from the end pieces with two curved ends meeting the ends of the desk. It is composed of four ornamental panels with the same relief molding as the ends and three deeper relief panels featuring the same shield. This design matches the much smaller Vice President's dais, which features two ends of the same design and one small frontal piece with two ornamental molding panels and one shield panel. Though the desk appears to be in good shape from the mahogany exterior, the top, drawers, and interior desperately need attention, which is difficult to come by in its current location. In order to understand why the desk exists in its current condition and current location, we need to start from the moment it became active on the Senate floor. Once the desk was placed in the Senate chamber in 1859, it became home to four Senate staff members for the next 100 years. The desk staff are as follows, starting from left to right seating positions on the desk. The journal clerk, who records the daily minutes and keeps a record of bills and resolutions. The parliamentarian, who provides advice on the precedents and practices of the Senate for the presiding officer and other senators and, assi and assists in the referral of bills to Senate committees, as well as keeping time in the Senate. The legislative clerk, who reads for the Senate, handling all the verbal duties on the Senate floor. And the assistant secretary, previously known as the chief or principal clerk, who manages the secretary's smaller matters, or the assistant legislative clerk, who manages the legislator's clerk, smaller matters. The fourth chair is usually filled by the assistant legislative clerk. Though these four places were typically filled by their respective officers, many noteworthy political figures and heads of state took their place behind the desk to address the Senate as well. The desk also saw several of the most tumultuous decades of world politics. Finished in 1859, the desk was present, present in the Senate chamber for the duration of the Civil War. Kentucky's own John C. Breckinridge, who was, a, who was vice president in 1861, presided over the clerk's desk as as J Jefferson Davis rose to bid the Senate farewell to become the president of the Confederacy on January 21st. By April 16th of that same year, the Senate chamber began to fill with Union soldiers as the Capitol took on the role of barracks. Many key moments in wartime legislation occurred in the Senate chamber during the Civil War, but two of the most historic moments the desk ever witnessed was after the war ended, when the nation's first impeachment trial took place in 1868 concerning President Andrew Don Johnson and when the first African-American Senator, Hiram Revels, was elected in Mississippi in 1870. He took the same seat that Jefferson Davis left just nine years earlier. Senate motions concerning the first global war, World War I, were passed in the presence of the desk, and World War II was not far behind. It is commonly known that the bombing of Pearl Harbor pulled the United States into the ever-increasing scope of the global conflict, and soon Churchill himself was in the nation's capital and its capital, more specifically, to encourage Congress to fight with all the spirit they could muster. On December 26, 1941, Churchill stood behind the clerk's desk with a mess of microphones in front of him and stage lights glaring down as he offered his words of support to his allies. The Senate's 96 seats were all filled as Churchill expressed his words of inspiration to the people of the United States, words that were so very needed for a country that had only recently delved into worldwide conflict. Many other influential political figures also addressed the Senate from behind the clerk's desk, such as Arthur J. Balfour in 1917, then British Secretary of State of Foreign, for Foreign Affairs, and King David Kalakaua of the Hawaiian Islands in 1874. 
31 in-chamber funerals were held in the Senate as well, with the clerk's desk often serving as a backdrop for the coffin. Some notable funerals involving the desk include James B. Beck, a senator in, from Kentucky in 1877 to 1890, and James S. Sherman, who died while serving as vice president in 1912. In 1938, a structural engineer discovered that the Senate chamber's ceiling was in desperate need of repair, as it posed a danger to the people below. Although action needed to be taken to make the chamber, chamber a safer place to conduct government business, the Second World War was on the horizon, and any changes had to wait while Congress focused solely on the threat of war. Once the war came to an end, the time had come to remove to renovate this chamber properly. And on July 1st, 1949, the Senate moved into its previous quarters in the old Senate chamber to the right of the rotunda on the second floor. The newly re renovated Senate chamber had no need for the old wooden Senate desks, and soon they were, they were moved out of the chamber for the last time. The desk journey to Kentucky began with the presiding officer's desk, which was presented to Alvin W. Barkley, the last vice president to preside over the Senate from that desk, by the architect of the Capitol, David Lynn. This was put into action by the Special Committee on Reconstruction of the Senate Roof and Skylights and Remodeling of the Senate Chamber on September 22, 1950, through Senate Resolution 357 of the 81st Congress Second Session. This action was meant to honor not only Vice President Barkley, but also the first Vice President to sit at the desk, John C. Breckinridge, and the entire state of Kentucky. After Barkley passed away, the desk was to be given to the state of Kentucky. Though the presiding officer's desk was given to Barkley, the clerk's desk still resided in the Capitol, cast to the side wall of the rotunda for a year before it left for Kentucky as well. Often, Emory L. Frazier of Whitesburg, Kentucky, of a Whitesburg, Kentucky native and the last chief clerk to sit at the clerk's desk would pass by the desk and wish for it to be preserved in history properly. Therefore, Frazier, a member of, of the Kentucky Historical Society, soon contacted Bayless E. Hardin, the secretary treasurer of the Kentucky Historical Society at the time, to see what could be done for the desk's future. On July 18, 1951, Frazier had sent a copy of his proposed resolution to dispose of the desk by giving it to the Kentucky Historical Society, and stated that he had experienced nothing but support for the resolution for the, from the committee and the vice president. He also states that his hope is that when the clerk's desk is in the possession of the KHS, Barclay will be inspired to give the presiding officer's desk as well, so that the rostrum may be reconstructed in, the Kentucky, in Kentucky's old Senate chamber for proper display. This resolution was Senate Resolution 185 of the 82nd Congress, Second Session, passed on August 1st, 1951, which dates through Public Law 731, 81st Congress, where materials of historic interest are removed and not re reused to authorize the disposal of the same in such a manner as it may direct. The clerk's desk was to be given to the KHS in hopes that it would soon be reunited with its matching presiding officer's desk. On August 3rd, 18, 1951, Frazier wrote to Hardin informing him that the resolution had passed and that he was awaiting the return of Senator Earl C. Clements in order to discuss proper removal. At this time, Hardin was indisposed in a Louisville hospital, but plan, plans continued on without him. By August 2nd, 22nd, Clements sent a letter to the office of the governor of Kentucky informing him that the desk was ready to be transported and that a state-funded highway truck would be a viable option including a sketch of the proper measurements for reference. From this letter, it is assumed that this course of action was taken and the desk arrived at the Kentucky Historical Society on September 14, 1951. The clerk's desk resided in the old Senate chamber in Kentucky's old Capitol building for 25 years, but the ultimate goal of a reunited U.S. Senate rostrum never came to fruition. After Vice President Barkley passed away in 1956, the presiding officer's desk was given to the, to the University of Kentucky, where it still resides in the Special Collections Research Center at the Margaret I. King Library. In 1976, the old Capitol building in Frankfurt was to be renovated to restore it to its original appearance, and so the clerk's desk had lost its place in the building. Wanting to find a safe long-term home for the object, the Kentucky Historical Society reached out to several potential new homes for the desk, including the Division of Political History at the Smithsonian in order to return the desk to its home city of Washington, D.C. When transfer back to Washington never came to fruition, 
the Kentucky Historical Society and the Kentucky Museum made a deal in which the desk would be given on a permanent loan to the Kentucky Museum. When the time came to move the desk into the newly renovated Kentucky building at the Kentucky Museum in 1979, it became apparent to the museum registrar, Patricia McLeish, that the desk was indeed a permanent loan and not a gift, which was, went, against, went against museum policy. She contacted Charles Pittenger, Jr., the Kentucky Historical Society's registrar at the time, requesting that the desk become an outright gift to the Kentucky Museum. Pittenger wholeheartedly agreed that the perils of a permanent loan were not worth the trouble, and a gift agreement was signed on October 25, 1979. The desk remains in the Kentucky Museum's collection to this day, where it, featured where it has featured in several ex exhibits before it was put away for the foreseeable future. Since the desk left the Capitol in 1951, it had undergone considerable wear and tear due to frequent relocation, exhibiting, and travel. The bottom edges of the desk have been scuffed, varnished as completely worn off in some spots. The inner planks of the pine have been considerably damaged due to frequent abuse by shoes of the sitters, and many parts have already been removed or replaced. It has been noted previously that the desk is quite large and awkward to maneuver, especially considering that the sheer weight of the desk itself is enough to deter anyone from relocating. After the desk's final exhibition at the Kentucky Museum, it was decided by the staff that the desk was to be put away in storage until it was properly cared for by a restoration expert. Because of its size, it proved to be impossible to move without substantial assistance, and even then, it would simply be unsafe for both the movers and the desk itself to move it anywhere besides the floor that it already had rested on. Therefore, the next course of action was to build a temporary wall around it to keep it safe from wandering visitors. Over time, the temporary room became much more permanent as other items were stored with the historic desk, sometimes with the desk acting as the storage unit itself, as display items were sat on top of it. During my time interning with the Kentucky Museum, the desk became a point of conversation between my supervisors and I. It quickly became evident to me that this desk needed proper care and detailed historical record so that it may be exhibited in the future, given that it was such a strong piece in the collection with historical ties to the state. With the encouragement of the staff, I pursued this project so that it may be exhibited properly, but it quickly became evident to me that, the, that a physical exhibit was beyond my power, so I chose a different path. Being interested in museum education with a focus on visitor accessibility, I knew there were other ways to ensure this desk got its proper place on a pedestal, even if that pedestal was digital. With this in mind, I applied for and received a faculty undergraduate student engagement grant in December 2019 and began my research. That following spring, I began emailing everyone I could to hopefully set up an appointment to discuss the desk and see what information they had in their possession. Due to my previous experiences with museums, I was not expecting many responses, but I, got, I did get one that proved to be key to my research. Melinda Smith, curator of the Senate, emailed me back within a week and was happily, happy to set up an appointment to meet with me in June and let me know she would compile any documents she could find concerning the desk for me when I arrived. From that point on, I spent every weekend looking through WKU's library for resources, as well as on several research databases, such as JSTOR, to begin collecting background information on the desk and the Capitol restoration. In June 2019, I traveled to Washington, D.C. to begin the majority of my research and peruse the collections in the Library of Congress for a week to gather everything that was missing from the accession file at the Kentucky Museum. During my visit to the Senate, I was granted access to the curators of the Senate collections documents concerning the desk, including several personal letters between Meeks, Slight, and Floyd that helped me eliminate the, origin, the origin of the desk in a way not highlighted before. After several hours of research in Melinda's office, we visited the Senate floor, where I was allowed to investigate the current Senate dais and its setup, and comparing it to the desk back in Kentucky. We also discussed the importance of the desk and its key role in the Senate. Melinda was ex expressed interest in possibly bringing the desk back to Washington re to restore it properly with funds from the government, which is a discussion that is ongoing at the moment. The next several days were spent visiting the Library of Congress to access their collections and read more about the Capitol Restoration Project that introduced the desk to the new Senate chamber. I found many useful articles in their newspaper and current, current periodical division, as well as in their microform division. Every night I detailed my experiences in a journal and organized my research for an easier approach to writing when I returned from the trip. 
This experience was a clear challenge in my research skills because the sheer size of the collections meant I had to complete preliminary research just to know where to look each day. During the first two days, I struggled considerably, but by the third day, I knew exactly where to start and had a fulfilling day of research that produced considerable results. When the trip finished, I began to detail outline of my historical documentation and highlighted any gaps left. Most of the information that I found in Washington naturally came to a dead end after the desk left the Capitol in 1951. So my next goal was discovering its history with the Kentucky Historical Society and its journey to the Kentucky Museum. I discovered that I was very lucky to get in contact with Melinda so quickly because getting in touch with somebody in Frankfurt proved very difficult, and only with persistent calling did I get in touch with a research librarian who was happy to scan their complete deaccession file for the desk and send it to me digitally. This was the last piece of the puzzle that I needed to finish the historical documentation portion of the project, and I had finished by January 2020. <coughs> The final plan for the desk presentation was to create an online exhibit with information and photos concerning the desk so that interested individuals would have easy access. It was briefly considered that a conservator be brought in to take a look at the desk and consult the museum staff on what could be done with the object, but the fuse grant money I received would not be enough to cover the cost, and the museum could not afford it either. Although this is still the eventual goal for the desk, visitors will be able to access the desk and learn about its history through an online platform as of right now. This process began after the bulk of my research was finished. I was initially trained on the web content management system OU Campus to create a web page for the desk on the Kentucky Museum's website. But during the design process, I, was met with, I met with the museum staff and it was decided that the exhibit would better be fitted for Top Scholar, WKU's digital research repository and publishing platform. The Kentucky Museum lacked a page of their own and by the creation of my exhibit, a page would be made for the museum, as well as a sub page for student research projects with the museum. This was completed in hopes that it would encourage future students interested in research projects with the museum to pursue their goals, knowing there would be a space for their finished projects to be published for all to see. <coughs> the online exhibit can be found on WKU's Top Scholar site in the Kentucky Museum's database under Student Research Projects. The project itself is split into two groups, documents and images. Under the document section, there are four documents available for perusing. Cast of Characters is a collection of brief sum summaries of John B. Floyd, Pringle Slight, and Montgomery C. Meeks, and Thomas U. U. Walter, the main, figure in the, the main figures in the desk's history. A Desk's Tale is a shortened version of the full historical documentation and analysis featured in this paper. A visual analysis of the U.S. Senate Clerk's Desk Is the, is the excerpt featured in this paper in which I assess the desk design in a visual and historical context. The final document is the full historical documentation and analysis featured in this paper. I chose to upload summaries of important parts of this paper to encourage people to interact with more with the exhibit. I believe uploading just this full document and nothing else would encourage, discourage everyday visitors from learning about the desk from a scholarly paper that includes specific historical and visual verbiage, as well as a supplemental, as well as supplemental subject matter that is simply not crucial for a brief time spent at an exhibit. Accessibility is a key part of my practice as an art historian, so I wanted the exhibit to feel as approachable as possible. And a lengthy, a lengthy research paper is certainly not approachable to everyday museum visitors. There are ten photos featured in the exhibit that are also in this paper. These images are crucial to the narrative of the desk, showing the important moments in which the desk became a backdrop, initial designs, and images of the, the desk in its current state. The collection was created with easy accessibility in mind as well, ensuring that visual visitors, that virtual visitors get the most out of their experience with the exhibit without being overwhelmed by information and visual aid. With the completion of the desk exhibit, the entire project was complete. This project became a learning experience as I explored new methods of research and studied the ways in which intellectual centers function and disperse knowledge. The most useful part of this experience, though, was studying the desk's unique journey to the Kentucky Museum in Bowling Green. 
I feel that I have gained a great deal of practical knowledge concerning the desk and the collection of items, concerning the collection of items, the ways that museum keep, museums keep and practice and preserve their, pro their objects, and the importance of clear and correct documentation. This project was created first and foremost to fill in a gap that was left wide open by improper documentation, care, and research that I wanted to close. The main issue was with putting the desk on exhibit during its time at the Kentucky Museum was that there simply was not enough information to properly present it to the public for observation and study. I believe that, through my dedicated investigation of the object and its history, the desk will be revived for future generations, generations to study. It creates a remarkable link between the state of Kentucky and the United States government that had yet to be outlined and is a key part of the, of the country's visual history.